It is 3 p.m. in New York and 7 p.m. in London. Live from Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Scarlett Fu. We bring you special coverage of the volatile trading week. Here's what I'm keeping an eye on. Volatility reigns. It is the word of the day of the week. Here's how it's showing up in U.S. equities, the top panel and treasuries, the bottom panel. The VIX in the top panel in white yesterday closing at 82, highest close ever. Last month at this time, it was at a 13 handle. The move index for treasuries, that's the VIX for treasuries, holding near its highest level since all the way back since July of 2009. Now, speaking of debt, the market for short-term corporate debt is seeing a lot of strain right now. And this is the spread of the 90-day commercial paper for non-financial companies to the OIS spread. You can see it's been widening out all through this month, uh, March until recently. And of course, the Fed addressed the widening of that spread by restarting its commercial paper funding facility program with Treasury, which is why it's coming down a little bit. now. Gold has not been holding up as well as you might think it should, partly because people have been forced to sell it to raise cash. And that accounts for the drop off here, even as stocks were tanking. Now, it is recovering today a bit with stocks, and there is speculation that the central banks across the world, including the Federal Reserve, will need to take more action. We now have Dow and S&P futures uh, reaching limit up here. The S&P are all down at least 4% in the past six days in a row. How we are going to find a floor. This is indeed an example of radical uncertainty. The Fed is doing what it can to support the availability of credit to households and businesses. Volatility surging to a record. We don't even know what the earnings are going to be, uh, you know, for pretty much any company for the foreseeable future. The good news is, is that we haven't triggered a circuit breaker here at the open. The tone is incrementally better. The Fed will establish the commercial paper funding uh, facility. This is what the market was, in essence, basically waiting for. Americans need cash now, and the president wants to get cash now. It's going to be big, and it's going to be bold. It frankly, seems like the markets like what they heard in terms of fiscal stimulus. What you're going to see this week is a lot of policy action to actually stem the impact that this can have on the economy. Now, for this afternoon's special market coverage, I'm joined alongside my colleagues, my partners in crime, Romaine Bostic and Joe Weisenthal. So another day, another Fed yeah. announcement, another yeah. Fed initiative. And just to uh, let you know, I mean, we are getting some headlines crossing the wire right now. This out of the Ang Angela Merkel, of course, of Germany, saying that EU leaders have agreed uh, to close Europe's borders to travel. Hmm. Uh, Merkel cites great readiness, in her words, to do what's necessary on the virus. Again, Europe uh, shutting down its borders uh, to travel. Joe? Yeah, absolutely an extraordinary day. Well, they all are extraordinary yeah. these days. We saw more Fed action opening up that uh, commercial paper facility. That will easily some of the credit strains facing some major companies. That didn't do a whole lot. On the other hand, when we saw that press conference earlier and we heard from Trump and Pence and Mnuchin mm -hmm. and the first real talk about w they want to go big, they want to get cash into people's pockets. Yeah. They want to get cash into people's pockets fast, yeah. Yeah. directly, every American. Those were some of the things that helped spur a right. little bit of a rally. But even now, you know, we're looking at a 4% gain. Yeah. You know, we felt, what, 12% yesterday. Right. Yeah, and we're talking some big numbers here, right? Up yeah. to $1.2 trillion is yeah. what they're right. saying. Right, so if that $1.2 trillion would materialize, just to put it into context, uh, the American Recovery yeah. Act back in 2009, uh, that was also $1.2 trillion in terms of upfront costs. There were some additional costs there after the fact. And then, of course, uh, you had that stimulus that was done in 2008. And don't forget, we had the Trump tax cuts, yeah. mm -hmm. which amounted to about $1.5 trillion although that wasn't necessarily all upfront cost, but it gives you some idea of the scale that we're dealing with. Here. And I wonder if it's going to be bigger in the end, because there is ultimately this view that we are looking at a true sudden stop for the global economy in the likes of which no one has any historical frame of reference for people pulling back everywhere. We just saw the headlines about borders being shut down uh, or being closed yeah. in Europe. Unprecedented scenes, unprecedented anxiety, unprecedented impositions on people to stay in their house and it's very easy to imagine that the final price tag of any stimulus bill is going to go a lot higher than what we see right now. Well, it's yeah. a moving it's a moving target at the moment. Yeah. And we don't know how big it's We're seeing by the day. And how bad it's going to get. Um, so when you look at how markets are reacting, I'm just looking at the intraday chart here for the Dow, the S&P, the Nasdaq, and the Russell 2000. Uh, and you can see that we did open higher 
I mean, this is after a, what, 12, 13% drop plunge yesterday. Yeah. The biggest since 1987. I mean, it's going to be hard to surpass the 1987 record. But in two days, uh, two yeah. trading days, no, two out of three trading days, we've done just that. If, we're, if we only move like 4% here, it'll be like a quiet day. Yeah, of, of late. Sir. Of late. All right, Romain is standing by with a couple of charts that he's been keeping an eye on. Romain? All right, well, when you peek under the hood of what's going on with equity, it's not a quiet day at all. Take a look at short-term funding markets. They basically got rocked like a hurricane today. This is LIBOR. This is essentially what banks charge to loan to one another. It's a huge part of what we talk about when we talk about liquidity and the idea that the mechanics of the market are functioning well. We saw this jump about 16 basis points today. That was the biggest one-day move we've seen in this lending rate going back, of course, to the financial crisis, October of 2008. There is this concern here that banks and other sort of lenders weren't going to really have access to the market. You saw those lending rates go up. I want to take you to the next chart here because it's going to kind of continue the story. And this is what we're seeing with swap spreads. This is actually the reach for dollars here. And again, this is not only traders here in the U.S., but you're seeing a lot of foreigners here trying to make a grab for dollars, and they're either not able to get them or the price that they're having to pay to get them is just too far out of reach. You saw these, uh, these levels sort of widen out uh, to levels that we haven't seen in years. This was the market basically saying we need something more from the Fed despite what the Fed had done yesterday despite what they had done last week they said we want more and around 9 45 a.m. we actually got that the Fed came in we saw those uh, those reports saying that they were actually going to uh, reinstitute that commercial paper facility that was last used back during the financial crisis the market seemed to respond to that well but you actually didn't see financial conditions ease too much you can see there on the far right of your screen a little bit of easing but you can see how far we've fallen and that all the measures that the Fed has taken, all of the measures that we've gotten out of the BOJ, ECB, and a lot of the other central banks around the world, they have yet to make a dent yet in some of the funding and liquidity issues. So when you talk about what we see in equity markets, Scarlett and Joe, and what we see in treasury markets, a lot of this, again, ties back to what we see in the short-term funding markets and the idea that the mechanics of this market right now are still sort of grinding at a halt. All right, thank you, Romain. Now, for more insight into today's market action, let's bring in Steve DeSantis, U.S. equity strategist at Jefferies, who joins us by phone. Steve, I want to uh, start the 12% plunge or so that we saw yesterday, the worst day since 1987. Was that to you looking like what a potential washout could be? And although you know the, today's mute move is like muted by relatively recent standards, could this be some sort of bottom-ish process that we're in the midst of here? Well, I think we would have said that on Thursday when right, we had a problem. move that was, <laughs> that was very similar to what happened on, on Monday. And then we had the nice bounce back on Friday. And then, you know, we proceeded to go down 12 or 13% yesterday. And then we get a bounce back today. And I, I think the, the big thing, obviously, and, and obviously you guys are talking a lot about this, is just the, the credit markets have to start behaving and one of the interesting things that I think of is the fact that if you remember back to 08, 09, what you ended up seeing was that maybe it wasn't one particular thing done by the Treasury, the Fed, the ECB. It was a whole host of things. So this is one of those things that takes some time to repair. But, I mean, they are on the ready. They, they kind of have the playbook now. Remember, in 08, 09, they were kind of yeah. flying blind at what they were going to try to attempt. Well, here we have a playbook from that time, and they seem to be executing that playbook step by step. And again, you got to see some improvement in the credit markets, but all this stuff seems like it will eventually start to make its way through and then unlock that market. Right. We have some headlines I just want to inform you of. Uh, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, says the Senate will vote on the House Virus Aid Bill. So the Senate is going to get ready to take up that House Virus Aid Bill. We're looking for some movement on that front. That is separate, of course, from what the Treasury Secretary has proposed in the latest round of aid to industries and individuals. On top of that, uh, we also have Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York City, making some comments. He says that it's not that far off, that's a quote, for New York City to hit 10,000 virus cases. Again, Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York City, says it is not that far off for the city to hit 10,000 virus cases. And that earlier he had said a shelter-in-place decision could be made in 48 hours. Uh, New Yorkers need to prepare for that possibility. Um, Stephen, let me return to you after uh, those stunning headlines there. What kind of headline gets investors 
uh, feeling more comfortable with taking risk these days. I mean, yes, it's going to be on the virus count and that falling, but we know that we have still not reached the peak of the virus count and the infection count here in the United States. So when it comes to what kind of government action can uh, help support markets, is it going to be something like the Senate takes up a vote or the White House proposing or floating ideas for a $1.2 trillion aid package? I think it's a whole, I mean, it's a, again, it's a whole host of things. First of all, I think the, uh, the 10,000 number really kind of resonates and makes you a little scared there. So any kind of improvement that you see from those numbers, you know, you're looking, always looking for that incremental change. And so is that number going higher, much higher? What's the rate of change? That's what you're looking for. You know, we also got some headlines today about from Regeneron and a few other companies with, you know, moving forward on, you know, potentially coming up with uh, a vaccine. So it's all these different things combined with what, you know, the Treasury, what the Fed is doing. It's a whole host of things that, again, it's not going to be one particular thing. It'll be all these different pieces all combined together mm -hmm. that start to make investors a little bit more comfortable about what's going on. So, Stephen, I mean, how do you get more comfortable uh, with what's going on here? Are there sort of parallels that we can draw from uh, the global financial crisis or other sort of financial crises uh, to sort of help investors sort of guide themselves uh, through what we're going through today? I mean, nothing compares to what, what this is. I mean, the global financial crisis was, you know, epic where we thought that, you know, everything was coming to a, the economy was coming to a screeching halt. And it is, right? I mean, we're going to have a quarter or two of disruption globally on, on growth. You look for things to get a little bit better. Back then, we had, you had no idea which financial company was going to go under, what bailout was coming next. And again, they're running the playbook very similar to 08, 09. And again, you start to look at, as you kind of pointed out earlier, LIBOR spreads. Are they widening or not? How is the high yield market? Where are we on capitulation of, you know, selling of high yield and credit instruments? Are companies continuing to tap their credit lines or do they feel a little bit more comfortable? Maybe something in like, you know, um, high quality company comes and does a bond offering and that gets through and, and gets, you know, that gets, uh, you know, that makes it to market. So there's a whole host of things that you kind of grind from, you know, a complete standstill to like, okay, six to nine months from now, we can see, you know, a much better backdrop here. So where do you start to buy and what do you buy? Because one of the things is you look at individual names, there is nothing that it hasn't been getting sold in recent weeks. If it exists, it's being sold. So you figure that even in the absence of clarity, on the absence of virus counts, on the absence of, of stimulus, some things are going to start look like bargains. What potentially could be a bargain? I think, the, I mean, everything looks like <laughs> a bargain at this point. And so, I mean, small cap has been something that traditionally bounces faster and harder. So when we got to the bottom on, you know, March 9th of 2009, we had a pretty big run for small cap in, in 09. In 16, when we hit a bottom in February, small cap in the cyclicals, you know, let us out of that. And so I think um, from the investors that I talked to, really everybody's very much focused on balance sheet, who has balance sheet risk, who's got the cleanest balance sheet. And so I think that's, that's the focus right now. I would say from an ETF flow perspective, kind of just monitoring ETF flows, anytime we have a, a good day in the market, it looks like the QQQ is the one that, that people kind of move towards to kind of get more exposure. Right. And so that's just kind of what we're seeing. Um, again, we, we think, you know, small usually gets that big bounce. Um, we, we definitely need it, given that small is 1,200 basis points behind large year to date. Yeah. So those are things that, again, we kind of look for. But, but Steve, when you talk about valuations, I mean, uh, I mean, when you look at the S&P 500, you look at how, how much valuation has come down. We're trading something like below a forward 15 uh, PE right now. But you go to the past recessions. I mean, you, we saw PEs drop something like down to 10 in the past recession, uh, well below where we are today. So I'm wondering, do we have to see some sort of meaningful devaluation further before we do sort of find that bottom that we started this conversation off with? So I think a couple of things on that. First of all, nobody cares about valuation when, you know, you're really worried about, you know, the, whether or not the company's going to make it. 
And so, you know, the big thing is really looking at balance sheet. And nobody has any idea what revenue is going to be. So how do you do like a price to sales ratio? Nobody has an idea what earnings look like. Some areas are going to be really, you know, having some hard times for more than six months, nine months. So I think, again, everybody's focusing on, on the balance sheet. I think the other thing is that, you know, the, now the, the Fed funds rate got cut to zero in 08, 09. We have the 10-year at under 1%. So long rates are also very, very cheap. So hard to make a case for, okay, we need to get to eight times, nine times. We bought them, I think, at 10 times earnings in, in 09. And what are we, 13 or 14 times, if you believe the earnings numbers today? Yeah. But, you know, again, it's not, earnings are not what people are focusing on right now. They're really looking at the balance sheet and what risks companies have. All right. Thank you so much. Stephen DeSanctis of Jeffries sharing your perspective here on the markets with us. Uh, I want to just bring in some headlines here. There's so many headlines. Uh, we'll start with Mark Esper, the defense secretary, says uh, the DOD is weighing activating the National Guard at the federal level. He's speaking right now in Washington. He says the department is weighing the activation of the National Guard at the federal level. We know the National Guard is already present in certain places that uh, are under quarantine, for instance, New Rochelle, New York, or the equivalent of quarantine. And Joe, you have some headlines on Germany. Yeah, I'm pretty astonished. Headline Merkel saying EU ministers have discussed joint debt options. No conclusion. For a long time in Europe, they've been talking about, well, the ultimate way to sort of finish the euro area project is some sort of joint budget, some sort of euro bonds project. This could be, we already have seen this crisis catalyze some re, uh, relaxing mm -hmm. of the uh, fiscal straitjacket that all the countries are supposed to be in post-crisis. So if we see some sort of joint debt solution, that would be a right. pretty historic move by Europe, even if it's small. All right. From New York. This is Bloomberg. All right, the Fed has been busy. Among the measures it's taken is that commercial paper facility that we've been talking about. It's going to let companies borrow directly, but will it be enough to spur bank loans to some of the troubled companies out there? Here with more, Bloomberg's Wall Street correspondent, Shanali Basic joining us. All right, Shanali, uh, this is a big deal um, that they would reinstitute this commercial paper facility. I guess the question is, who's going to use it, and is it going to really cover all of the uh, markets out there that actually need it? That's the number one question in the yeah. market right now, because even with this commercial paper facility that everybody wanted that I had covered, it doesn't seem like it's enough to ease a lot of the strains that are in the market right now. Remember, everyone from airlines to retailers to travel companies are tapping the bank lines right now. And some of these, as they get federal assistance, the banks are going to be waiting for what the government does also to see what types of uh, terms they're going to be giving their clients as well. But in the meantime, I mean, this is sort of a recognition, and it doesn't solve the problem completely, but it really is just a recognition that the sort of lifeblood, the credit system that allows companies to stay afloat, roll over, financing from day one to day two to make payroll, et cetera, was seriously coming under a strain and something needed to be done right away. The interesting thing to me was last week the Fed had made this recognition, right, with their $5 trillion liquidity promise to yeah. the markets. What took so long? That's the thing everybody is asking now. It took until this week for that recognition. Well, they recognition. had to get a basically approval from Treasury, right? Who's now providing a $10 billion backstop to this plan as well. So at least you have a lot of government intervention here, still that fiscal response, and we were talking about it earlier on the show, Scarlett, that one th those $1,000 checks that are going to Americans will take a little while to play out. And so you have pressure on the consumer, which has been rising the uh, raising the banking system higher, yeah. and you have pressure on the, on the companies also that are lending from these banks. It's not clear that any of these Fed actions will do a lot mm. to spur lending through that system the way that we want to see it done. So these are certainly things that we need to keep in mind. Um, other government measures that are being brought up also affect the banks directly. For instance, uh, delays on mortgage payments and delays on student loan repayments as well. What are you hearing from your sources? So those two things are things that everybody does want to see, certainly the mortgage payments in particular. The other things that the Fed might do, and we reported this just today, is reduce the leverage requirements for the banks. This has been a great opportunity for the banks to turn around and say, this has been regulation that has been stopping us from doing what we need to do, which is lend, right. but let's see now if they start to reduce those requirements, 
Remember, these rates yeah. are ultra low. Will it be right. profitable for them to do so? So it'll be interesting, I mean, because we know, I mean, obviously the reason they had to go back to Treasury to even get permission was because of Dodd-Frank. Uh, Mark Cabana, who is over at Bank of America, Alex Harris, one of our Bloomberg News reporters, she spoke to him a little bit earlier, and he actually raised this issue about money markings, basically saying that they're still dealing with this the issue of redemptions or potential redemptions, so they need to have that cash buffer there. They can't necessarily go through this facility in the same way that other funds can. Do we know if the Fed is going to address that issue? Uh, unclear how much the money markets will be impacted by the right. Fed's move because I've got to say they're not just impacted by the commercial strain, mm -hmm. also the hedge fund strain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the end though, all this talk about lending, company banks are only going to lend to companies that aren't collapsed, that are like that are doing well or that are surviving. And right now there is a lot of concern about everyone because the economy is in a free fall by many stretch. So is, in the end, like, we're not going to be able to do anything on the credit side until we see some signs of stabilization, hence the importance of these fiscal packages, bailouts, and so forth. And that's the number one thing here. What companies are going to make it out of this alive right. and what companies will continue to struggle? We know a lot of these companies have really messy balance sheets to right. begin with. Some of these industries, like the energy industry, have longer-term problems than the coronavirus, right. and that subsiding can fix. All right, Shanali right. Basak, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Shanali Basak, our Wall Street correspondent. Joe? All right, it is time now for Options Insight. We are joined by Christian Fromhertz of Tribeca Trade Group. Christian, let's just start with this overall market volatility, extraordinary levels day in and day out. We're at like a 4% move in the S&P, and it feels like one of the quietest days uh, in a long time, 4.2% right now. How long can we just sustain this type of volatility uh, at these levels day in, day out like this? Hey, Joe, yeah, it's, a, it's really a, a test of patience, right? I mean, I think, you know, one of the questions on everybody's mind is, you know, when can I start to kind of to, to look at this as a buying opportunity? And, you know, I think in this market, it just, you know, with the with the day-to-day -day swings that you just mentioned, you know, I think it really helps to, to kind of have a, a checklist and, and kind of just wait for things to kind of materialize. I mean, you know, the VIX obviously got to, what, what about an 85-ish, that, or, you know, 84, 83, I think, is where right. we topped out. And, yeah, you know, today it's, it's a, like a tiny victory to see us back below 80, but um, I don't really huh. see us really giving up any technical right. ground, you know, in the VIX, and, and we'd really like to see that come in a lot more than, you know, just under 80. All right. Well, Christian, I mean, a tiny victory means 77.15, which is kind of astonishing to say that given uh, how low uh, we've seen a lot of the volatility gauges over the past uh, few years. Uh, how far down do you think uh, we have to start to see some of these measures go before we could start getting some sense of stability in the market and maybe uh, a little bit of an all clear for at least those folks who do want to take on risk? Yeah, well, I'm, one of the things that I that I always put on my charts just to capture like the the, the very short term trend is just a five five day uh, exponential or just a regular moving average, and you know that tells me that um, that would get us you know if we start to drop below say 55 in the VIX and even better below 50, um, I think that would at least kind of get us off of that that short term trend uh, that we're seeing right now and vice versa that goes with with the indices too, with the S&P and with NASDAQ, I would like to see us reclaim that five day moving average um, and get back above that, which, you know, it, they're both kind of, they're both confirming one another. And right now we're just not seeing very many divergences, which is what I'm also looking for. Christian, one of the striking things that a lot of people have been discussing over the last week is this sort of inability for the Fed, which people consider to be of all dampener or of all suppressant to really do much rate cuts, expanding the balance sheet, asset purchases. Has it surprised you that some of the classic uh, tool, tools in the toolkit on the monetary side, that the market is almost completely indifferent to them? It is, right? I mean, we've seen these things before, and, and, and it does kind of ring true with, with what we've seen in 2008. If you remember when they were announcing various different quantitative easing and, and trying to, to bring down interest rates, you know, they would have a very minimal uh, impact. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Every time they announce one of these, even though it seems like they're blockbuster type type things, like $1 trillion was just, I heard, in the last hour, it's, it gives us like a sugar rush for about 10, 15 minutes. And then the market, you know, kind of just, uh, you know, just it completely ignores it. And that's kind of what we saw Sunday night with futures as well. 
All right, our thanks there to Christian Fromarts of Tribeca Trade Group. Uh, thanks for that uh, today. Let's take a look, quick look at where we stand with the markets here as we get a little bit closer to the close of trading today. That's the B500 up about 4% on the day. This is Bloomberg. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York, I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Jill Weisenthal, and we are 30 minutes from the end of the trading day. All right, taking a look at how stocks are trading right now, we are looking at a rally on our hands, but I say rally, and it's not really a rally the way that we've seen 12% gains. We got the angry gains. cellos under here, Scarlett. I know. Well, you know, because yesterday it was a big, big sell off, so how about that? The Russell are those 2000. Cellos or is that I love the cellos, it's but I'm violins. looking forward to okay. the day, right. way in the future. Whoever but... picked this music, kudos to you. Get back Treasuries on are falling, yeah. yields are rising. Look yeah. at the 10-year yield back at 1%. You get paid even. a whole percent on 10-year treasuries. Yeah. Wow. Oh, they're giving money. Sign Amazing return there. And Regeneron, one of the big winners in the session. A lot of stocks winning today, but clearly Regeneron, people getting excited about the possibility that it is uh, jumping into the race to come up with a coronavirus treatment. Yeah, but unfortunately, when you look at some of the winners today, you're talking about the S&P 500. Utility stocks, mm -hmm. for example, are your uh, big gainers there in the S&P 500. Staples, real estate as well. Uh, you know, kind of interesting to see uh, that, you know, this is what people are flocking to. So not necessarily a risk on day. Uh, we should also point out, we don't have it on the screen here, but the home builders actually really taking it on the chin today. A lot of concerns here, uh, not about the declining environment, but also just the idea here uh, that with the oil prices down and Texas being sort of one of the big bright spots of the home building market for the past yeah. uh, few years, that that could be hit hard. Yeah. So you're seeing them down. Of course, you see Staples here uh, up about 7%. All right, the historic shakeout in the stock market, it's testing Bitcoin's youthful resilience, while equities are experiencing some of the most volatile trading in a decade. How about the firstborn for crypto? So for more, let's bring in Catherine Coley, CEO of Binance Holdings, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange platform, She's CEO of Binance US. She joins us over the phone in San Francisco. You know, uh, Catherine, I think a lot of people bought Bitcoin or maybe other cryptocurrencies thinking that perhaps they would own some uncorrelated asset, maybe an asset that would be a uh, hedge against financial calamity, especially since Bitcoin was essentially born during the financial crisis. It hasn't behaved as such at all. And in fact, when we've seen big down days, such as uh, last Thursday in the market, we also saw major sell up in Bitcoin. What do you make of the cross correlation between Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies and traditional risk assets like the S&P 500? Hi. You know, you're seeing the same efforts go through. I call it the crick cycle in traditional assets, where you're seeing that crisis yield a response, improvement, and then complacency. So in the regular traditional asset classes, as in with Bitcoin, you're seeing that complacency in the market turn into crisis, creating panic. That's going to generate sell-offs across the board. However, you're still going to see the appetite for trading a 24-7 accessible market really stay strong. And Bitcoin year-on-year, has outperformed. And in fact, if you look at a chart, year-to-date chart for Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin had been rallying for most of January into mid-February, reaching, what, 10000 almost $400, uh, pr uh, dollars, and then it started falling with uh, other risky assets. So for a while, when it looked like the coronavirus was a story for Asia, maybe parts of Europe, uh, this seemed to be uh, a reasonable safe haven. What do you think happened, Catherine, once it became apparent that the U.S. was not immune to the virus? You know, you also saw when the virus uh, kind of took part in other parts of the world, a uh, resurgence of trading volumes taking place in Asia when the instituted quarantine took place. So I think you'll see the same thing occur in the U.S. once we get more firm guidelines on what the quarantine means for America. So, Catherine, I mean, going forward here, I mean, there were a lot of sort of structural uh, changes coming uh, with regards to not just Bitcoin, but really uh, that crypto space in general. Obviously, a lot of folks are talking about that happening coming up in May. Uh, when you look at the current market environment, uh, how does all of that sort of fit in? You know, we've, we've seen such a maturity from last year in this space with institutions being able to identify who are the, you know, here are the key players in the crypto space, and now the prices are now affordable for uh, huh. those, those institutions to come in. So you've got a much more robust system. Trading engines are stronger uh, than ever. They've been able to test volumes that they've never seen before. Um, and so we're really growing up with this space right now. But do you worry that one of the narratives is busted, at least temporarily, because one of the 
Again, I go back to this thing. A lot of people were like, Bitcoin, the new digital gold. Bitcoin, the hedge against financial calamity. Bitcoin, the hedge against when uh, uh, Jerome Powell adds $700 billion to the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. These were all things that we know for a fact that a lot of people got enthusiastic by and hasn't done much. Does that make when it's talking about onboarding new people or getting institutional money into the space so that they uh, you know, want to have it an allocation as part of their portfolio? Does the performance of Bitcoin recently, even if it's a weird panic, um, make those arguments a little harder to make? I, I think that markets are still trying to figure out what exactly a safe haven means. And to the extent that Bitcoin can survive when it's a mass-based uh, you know, technology that we can trade on 24-7, regardless of our environment, that's more sound and proof than uh, supply chain problems that we're seeing from national traded stocks. So uh, I continue to see Bitcoin being something that we can continue to engage with, regardless of the, the safety and concerns of, of the U.S., and globally maybe engage it's with still, but... it's still a global it's still a global conversation right. and that's something that's super important when we're seeing something like this pandemic affect us all mm. maybe engage with but if people aren't able to work Romaine, and they're not able to get paid it doesn't matter if you're looking at bitcoin which can't be used for any practical application and people aren't just spending money in general yeah and I, I wonder too i mean how much of this is i mean we've uh, somewhat of uh people liquidating sort certain right. assets that have perform well in order to sort of cover any potential margin calls. We've seen that play out with gold, with other sort of uh, haven assets mm -hmm. that had appreciated in value. Did you see any of that, Catherine? Yeah, I mean, you saw if people are treating Bitcoin as already their high risk asset that they're going to be diversifying their funds to. If you're seeing your, you know, uh, common, uh, common gains fall dramatically, you're going to cut those higher risk items as well. So you saw some of that capitulation take place. But I certainly think that as people aren't able to work and have to be resorted to their homes, this is something that everyone can access from their phones right. and begin to be a participant in the market. All right. Really appreciate you taking the time. Catherine Coley, CEO of Binance US. Now coming up, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin pitches up to $750 billion in checks to be sent to Americans reeling from the coronavirus. We dissect next the details in the Trump administration's plan as it stands right now. This is Bloomberg. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell now says the Senate will vote on the virus aid bill that was passed by the House. He adds that the Senate will not leave town until a third assistance package is complete. Meanwhile, Bloomberg has learned that the Trump administration is now considering a stimulus package up to $1.2 trillion, which would include direct payments. Joining us now from Washington is Anna Edgerton, who covers Congress for Bloomberg News. So that's a lot to, to get your head around. But right now, uh, it looks like the initial aid package uh, that both the Senate and the House passed is done. That's $7.8 billion. Remind us of what is included in this House virus aid bill that the Senate is now getting ready to vote on. So first we had the first fiscal response that was the $7.8 billion. Then we had the House bill, which is focused on things like paid sick leave for families, making sure that anyone can get free virus testing that needs it, expanding some of the Medicaid options for low-income families. Now the Senate is looking to pass that second House bill and move forward to a larger fiscal stimulus, which was what Mnuchin mentioned, that would be up to $1.2 trillion. So, you know, obviously when the TARP vote happened uh, during the financial crisis, they passed it barely, and it was an extremely unpopular bill nonetheless, and most people didn't want to vote for it because it was a bailout for banks. This time around, as they get towards one of these big numbers, will there be more pressure for members of both sides to vote yes, given the perception that, or reality, that is uh, giving money to uh, people directly? Well, that's a great question, Joe. And one thing that's been really interesting about this whole discussion is that you know the fiscal balance of this doesn't really seem to come into play at all. You know, everyone that we've spoken to says that this is the this is the time to act big, to act bold. And you know, part of that could just be that it's a Republican president asking for it. So the Republicans who would like to consider themselves to be fiscal hawks are not going to push yeah. back on this. But you know, under a Democratic president, that was a different calculation. So it. You know, Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, did say that it's a very cheap time to borrow this money right. since interest rates are so low. So they seem to really just have consensus to go big on this and make sure that they 
be as ambitious as possible to try to get in front of this crisis. Yeah, I mean, fiscal balance. I mean, I mean, come on, let's get serious here. I mean, there wasn't fiscal balance uh, on, on past crises like this. Uh, we heard from Republican Senator Lindsey Graham. He's actually come out and said he actually opposes the idea of giving checks directly uh, to Americans. He basically says uh, that he would rather see loans to support companies so that they can essentially keep people employed. Uh, is there some sense here that we would see enough of a split amongst Republicans that could derail uh, any sort of effort of what Mnuchin sort of put out there today? Dude, these are tough, tough proposals for people to get behind. You know, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around it and you know, make sure that this is the best way to respond to a crisis that is still unfolding. It appears that Lindsey Graham is in the minority on this. You know, yeah. we have the very conservative senators like Tom Cotton and uh, Rand Paul, you know, who have said that they support these cash handouts, right. along with very progressive House members like Ro Khanna and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So between yeah. the kind of strange ideological coalition we have behind this, it looks like this will be an idea that gets traction. All right, we're gonna have to leave it there. Our thanks there to Anna Edgerton giving us that update from Washington. From New York, this is Bloomberg. All right, counting down to the close here on another wild day. Of course, coming off of yesterday's decline, uh, the worst decline we've had, of course, since that Black Monday up today. Right now, about 6% on the S&P 500. As we head towards the close, I'm Romain Bostic here with Scarlett Fu and Joe Weisenthal. And pretty incredible moves because yesterday we saw a drop of 12% yeah. in the S&P, 13% in the Dow Industrials. Today we're up about 5.5% on the S&P, and it feels like a really slow day, Joe. I know. You know what is a pretty striking move that I'm looking at today? TLT, the long bond ETF, down 6.3%. That is its worst day ever. So you have to imagine that in this panic, a lot of people are like, you know what, I'm just going to hang out in treasuries for a while. You're down to 6.3%. Ten-year yields yielding 1%. So you've lost about six years yeah. of uh, coupon payments on long-term treasuries in one day. Of course, it's done extremely well during the sell-off, and we know the big rates decline at the yeah. long end. But uh, if you're buying for price, you can get slammed pretty hard pretty fast. I just think it's amazing how we got here so quickly to a point where markets would unequivocally endorse helicopter money. Yeah, Share right. a scenario in which a Republican administration yeah. would propose sending checks to everyone within two weeks and we yeah. would go off to the races yeah. to an extent. Yeah, it's extraordinary times. And I think the market is finally coming to terms with the idea that this really isn't the global financial crisis. This is something different. Mm -hmm. Is it worse? Who knows? Uh, but it maybe does call for extraordinary measures. And as far as the risk appetite today. I mean, when you look at sort of what's being bought, you're not necessarily seeing risk appetite per se. Utilities actually up about 13 percent on the day. That's your big mover of the day. Consumer staples up 7 percent. Real estate up 6.5 percent. Materials up 6 percent. So these aren't growth stocks we're seeing people buying here. Uh, these are, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, defensive in nature. And, of course, the big decliners here continue to be those that are linked to the travel industry. Uh, yeah. Within consumer services, you have hotel companies, you have uh, the cruise operators, uh, you have yeah. airlines. Yeah, we should point out the airline index, S&P uh, airline index, attracts the five big airlines, down 6% on the day. United, Delta, Alaska, and American all down. Delta down 12% right now. And speaking of Delta, uh, Moody's may cut Delta's credit rating to junk status. So that is uh, an indication that... Uh, those who yeah. own Delta uh, debt may have to sell it if they're limited to investment grade debt. And I think one thing that kind of gets lost in what we heard from Mnuchin uh, today was also the comments from Trump about the idea that there would be some sort of help for airlines yes. and the travel yeah. industry. They didn't put a number to it, but this idea, it seemed to be the hint that there would be a bailout or some sort of major support for these industries, which of course are getting hit the hardest here. Well, speaking of industries getting absolutely slammed, or companies specifically, Boeing shares, wow. they're down 6% on the day, but at one point, well, I'm not exactly sure what the low was. At one point, they were down like 15%. They're 20% off the low. Okay, they were down 22%, Joe, so you're yeah. a little off. But no, 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 I'm just saying they're, they bounced 20% <laughs> since they're low today. That is okay. how this stock is yeah. like trading like a penny stock. Well, okay, it's 100, it's 101, 25 was the low of the day, 121, 71 we're at now. I mean, they're down, obviously, what, something like 70%. Yeah. Obviously, the 737 max issues. But again, yeah. Brooke Sutherland sort of brought this up uh, earlier, that now companies like Boeing, which were sort of facing things uh, that had nothing to do with coronavirus with right. regards to their uh, issues, uh, could now 
actually, uh, now it's being compounded, but they could actually get uh, some type of government help. And part of, of that is because not only are they a big employer and a big exporter, but the supply chain, their, their suppliers, their customers, I mean, it spans American industry. And if you don't rescue Boeing, the ripple through effect would be yeah, pretty huge. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. For more market analysis, we're joined now by former FX rage trader and the voice. <laughs> the Bloomberg Audio Squawk, Vince Signorella. Sorry, Cue the Vince, cellos. I don't care. I'm always going to emphasize your wonderful voice. Uh, up 4.5% today with a few minutes to go in the S&P 500. When do we get a normal day again? How long can volatility of this intensity, down 10%, up 9%, down 12%, up 4.5%, how long can this be sustained, or is there really no limiting factor on volatility? I, I would basically say, what are your plans for Labor Day weekend? Um, <laughs> it looks like it's going to be with us for quite some time. As long as the virus is there, we're going to have this kind of volatility. All right, Vince. Uh, so we have this volatility, Vince, but, I mean, there is a sense here that um, – until we see that volatility sort of drop down to something reasonable, we can't really have any sort of meaningful uh, rally, I guess, in stocks, at least not nowhere near back to where we were before. Is there sort of a level that you're keeping an eye on, Vince? Yeah, um, well, we saw it hold around 2395. I mean, it traded through, obviously, uh, a couple of days ago. We're now back, bounced back above it. Basically, what I would like to see for a little bit of a return to normalcy, and the yeah. volatility will still be there, is you sort of get this sort of EKG kind of trading pattern around 2400, yeah. and then you'll get you'll see the next move for the market. So you'll trade below, trade above, trade below, above, and then the market will, will be setting you know sort of multiple days of lows, multiple days of highs, and then the next move from there will probably be your next real move. And if it's a sell move, I would say get out of the way for another major decline. Yeah. And if it's a buy move, then you could probably at least get your, your toes wet again. All right, Vince Signorella, stick by there. Of course, looking very dapper in a tie. I don't think I've ever seen Vince in a tie. <laughs> All right, as we head to the market close, let's bring in Matt Maley. Let's see if he's wearing a tie. He's the chief market strategist at Miller Tayback. He joins us today uh, from Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, Matt, um, we're getting a little bit of a bounce here. When you look sort of at the, uh, the fundamentals of sort of what's causing this bounce, it's not necessarily encouraging. We're seeing a lot of defensive stocks rally. Uh, do you trust uh, this bounce here, or are we just sort of in for more of that EKG effect that Vince referred to? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's it, the chances that we continue to have uh, some pretty wild volatility are very high. Whether we get the 12, 10 to 12 percent moves on a daily basis, I hope those will go away for a while. Uh, but, you know, four to five, six percent, uh, you know, we're going to see those from time to time and more often than we'd like uh, for the foreseeable future. And I just think that, uh, you know, like I said, that this situation where the Fed's uh, uh, is shooting a bazooka, now we have a fiscal side getting a bazooka, but they're not the reasons the market uh, went down like it did in 2018. Yeah. So reversing those situations aren't the same. So I want to get your thoughts, Matt, on what Steve Mnuchin had commented on when it comes to the market. He said that the White House, the administration, wants to keep the stock market open, but may consider shortening hours uh, of the trading day at a later point. Where do you stand on that debate on whether to close the market, adjust the hours, or perhaps um, fiddle with the circuit breakers? Are, are things working the way they should, or does there need to be a change? I really don't think there needs to be a change. I mean, the circuit breakers have worked very well to, to calm things down uh, on a, three different three different occasions. Uh, the, SC, the, the market did fall fall lower each time, but but not dramatically so. And the second circuit breaker didn't kick, kick in. Uh, but I also think closing the markets unless you absolutely have to, uh, it, it, you, people can't get to their money. And even if you sh shrink the the, the, trinking, sh uh, the trading day, that gives people less confidence they can get that they can get to their money. So uh, I think that actually will raise fears uh, if they start shrinking mm -hmm. the, the trading day, or certainly if they shut it down, rather than uh, calm them. I, I think the uh, the circuit breakers are doing their job that they need to be doing. So from a volatility perspective, the spikes happened. We know that. What's the trade here? Should people still be hedging? Or at this point, is that move too late? And should people think about perhaps uh, finding opportunities to sell volatility to other people who are extremely nervous? Yeah, I mean, putting on uh, uh, hedges here is so expensive with the VIX. Right. I mean, uh, you know, it moved above 80, now above 70. Uh, it's really kind of a lost trade. And you saw, as you mentioned, uh, Joe, about the uh, what happened in the, in the bond market today, in the Treasury market. That's getting to be a, a dicey proposition, too. So right. if, you wanna, uh, if you're a little nervous, raise some cash and put it in a money market account for a little while uh, so that you can buy some, uh, uh, some things at discount so when we get, if the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater once again. Uh, so, Vince, uh, jump in here. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about the dollar. 
We've kind of missed this uh, for most of the day. I mean, it was up about one and a half percent at uh, one point, talking about the Bloomberg dollar spot index, seen basically kind of a uh, really outperforming pretty much every uh, major peer as I see it on my screen right now. Uh, this is uh, pretty remarkable. And when you consider the reach for dollars that we're seeing around the globe, is this something that's going to persist or do we see this as just something that's somewhat temporary and then we'll sort of go back to the normal trade? Vince? All right, I think uh, we lost Vince. Uh, Matt, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of what we're seeing uh, uh, in the FX markets here and just kind of the persistent dollar strength. you have any yeah, yeah. thoughts on that? <laughs> they lost me. Is Vince back on? Vince, you're back on? Vince, you're back on. Yeah. You want to talk to us about the persistent I, I, dollar strength? I, I'm here if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah we can hear you now. Gonna... I think it's going to continue for a while. There's there's the, the credit markets, at least in the money markets, is shorter end drawing up. That's why Fed's doing all these repo and the extraordinary repo again they announced today for a week. Uh, until that passes, you're actually seeing people going out in the spot market buying dollars because they can't borrow. I mean, it's a it's an unusual phenomenon, but it's something that would, will persist as long as the short end of the market is, is a tough place to, to borrow it. All right, you're hearing the closing bells here, Scarlett and Joe. Uh, I mean, a good day, I guess, if you look at it just, <laughs> just strictly in the lens of one day, uh, up about 6%, of course, on the day. But, of course, we haven't retraced all of the losses that we had uh, yesterday. No, we didn't even do half the, lo half the retracement that yeah. we saw yesterday. But, you know, we, at one point this morning, the futures had gone red. Yeah. And so it looked like perhaps we were going to get another down day. But... The, the uncertainty of this, of the outcome of this uh, virus, this crisis, right. is so extreme between both the public health standpoint and the economic standpoint right. that it kind of makes sense that even slight variations in one's expectation of the trajectory of the economy or the public health could have huge swings just because the outcomes are so wide in their disparity. Yeah, and for the folks who are sort of brave enough to or dumb enough to try to time this market, we should point out we <laughs> haven't seen two back-to-back -back gains in the S&P 500 since going back to... Uh, February 12th. So we've had this sort of seesaw where we have this string of declines and we get this rally and then it just resumes that decline, you know, the very next day. So that's some, something definitely you should, people should be mindful of. Yeah. And I'm just taking a look at just the, the size and the scope of the moves here. 23%, um, so almost a quarter of the S&P 500's 500 members rose more than 10%, at least 10% today. Uh, that sounds like a lot, but yesterday, on the day in which the S&P declined 11%, you had two-thirds of its members falling at least 10%. So... Yes, we made up some of the damage, but not even close to what we had uh, saw yesterday. So some big moves, and as we were pointing out earlier, the big movers are really in those defensive sectors, utilities, REITs. Right. It's not as if people are saying risk on it and pursuing uh, yeah. the riskiest of assets with abandon. Yeah, we did see some money come out of Treasuries, but again, we're talking about the mechanisms of the market here uh, are often moving with things other than sort of okay, general sure. fundamentals and risk taking. And we see, if you look at, uh, you know, information technology within the NASDAQ up over 7%, some talk about some of these tech companies being popular because, A, they're kind of the new staples. A lot of them have really good balance sheets, yeah. uh, which but we know that balance sheets right. are prized right now. So even a company like Apple, which is exposed to so many risks, has so much cash. Yeah. So something, uh, something to watch there. I mean, we've seen so many analyst notes that have sort of pulled out, you know, Microsoft, what could be a yeah. place to, to hide out Zoom video because of the idea yeah. that you have this sort of work from home effect. But again, right now, nobody really knows no. what a multiple can even be. You have no clarity on what that E, what yeah. that denominator right. is going to be until we get these earnings reports, until we, and really, frankly, until we get something more out of the CDC and health officials as to uh, whether the number of cases is is slowing. Absolutely. The earnings report will only tell us what happened in the previous right. three months. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to forecasting, no one knows what that is. And even when they do give a forecast, it's obsolete by the time they publish it and tell anyone about it because everything's a moving target. Yeah. So to that end, let's bring back our panelists, uh, Bloomberg's Vince Signorella and Matt Maley, chief market strategist over at Miller Tabak. Um, I want to ask Matt a little bit about the small caps because uh, Citigroup had an interesting note today in which it said the value in U.S. small caps is merely an illusion. They wouldn't touch mm. it right now. And, of course, this is because small caps have been laggards no matter whether the market is rising or falling. If uh, the broader market, the S&P 500, is declining, small caps fall even more. When the, the S&P 500 recovers, the small caps don't do as well. What do you, what, what's your take on small caps, Matt? Is there any value there? Or even if there is, you just wouldn't go near it right now because 
it's all guesswork. Uh, yeah, it, that's exactly the latter, being that it, say go near it at all. Yeah, unless you really know the company and really you know, know uh, specific names uh, that can really, and you feel strong that they can bounce back, uh, yeah, you want to avoid these names. And it's interesting you talked about how some of these defensive names did so well and that some of these uh, you know, high-quality tech names are acting well. I mean, it makes total sense. I mean, the whole market is getting clobbered. Do you want to try to hit a grand slam by getting some small-cap name uh, uh -huh. that's going to you know, bounce back amazingly? Or, or do you want to buy a, a good quality name like a Microsoft where you can still hit a two-run two -run homer and, and do really well? with a lot less risk. And I, so I think uh, people are really looking at those names, and rightfully so. Uh, Vince, your view on, you know, if you're ready, if you wanted to take a risk out here, if you're saying, you know what, I think they're going to get a deal, or I think that the actions that various state and local governments are taking to mitigate the virus are going to start showing up soon. Let's say you feel that perhaps there is some sort of turning point. Where might you think about underpriced risk? Well, I would uh, I would look at companies that are going to possibly even extend um, the leverage they're they're kind of getting now uh, because of this. People like uh, Amazon as online shopping is obviously picking up as people are not leaving their homes. Uh, we just seen FedEx numbers crossing and their earnings uh, uh, they're gaining after earnings because of revenue beats. I think some companies like that and UPS, um, you know, some of the really beaten down issues you guys were talking about Boeing earlier. I mean, it's a company that, you know, it's a, it's a need to, have to. Um, it, there's no way the federal government lets somebody, a company like Boeing, you know, go by the wayside. So there are certain industries in certain places, you know, perhaps even some of the other airlines, some are being downgraded into the junk or, or threatening to be downgraded into junk. Um, they're really crucial to business and transportation in the U.S. When they get beaten down, I think, you know, if you're going to look at something long term, sort of close your off. Uh, yeah. they're, they're sort of the better places. All right. Well, uh, speaking of beaten down, uh, FedEx actually out with earnings right now. Of course, uh, FedEx shares uh, down about 41 percent over the past four weeks. The company out with 3Q adjusted EPS and fiscal uh, and its 3Q adjusted revenue numbers, which did beat estimates. The company, though, is saying that it's suspending its fiscal 2020 outlook due to uh, the COVID-19 uncertainties. Again, the 3Q numbers did beat 141 versus 127. Uh, again, I'm not sure how much fundamentals matter at this point. Right. Uh, Matt, um, we have a market here here that obviously isn't trading off fundamentals. It's primarily trading off fear uh, and speculation to a certain extent. Um, when we start to get a little bit more clarity from some of these companies, not just on what happened in their most recent quarter, but on what they foresee for this year and next, uh, do you think that would be enough to maybe at least, if not bring risk appetite back into the market, at least provide a little bit more stability as people will have a handle on what to expect rather than just sort of trading off uh, just a complete unknown? Oh, no question. I mean, we, we, there's so much uncertainty. I mean, it's there's just, there's just no way to know uh, when this is going to end. So what are the earnings going to be for the rest of this year? We just don't know. Uh, so, I mean, that's why you know, taking, going out the risk scale is very difficult. You want to go for those high-quality names with great balance sheets. Having said that, you just mentioned Boeing. Uh, I was looking at the chart before I came over here. You look at the weekly uh, relative strength index. It's by far the most oversold it's ever going to be. And these guys are saying uh, they're not going out of business. Uh, they're in a duopoly. Uh, so uh, you, will you lose money tomorrow on the stock? You, maybe you will. But uh, there are some great opportunities. And you just have to ease your way into them. Do not try to buy them all at once. Yeah. Buy a little bit now. If the market was a little bit lower, buy more and, and, and play that game rather than trying to do uh, pick the bottom, as they say. So yeah. rather than going for the, uh, you know, whatever, the grand slam home run with some small caps, buy a name like Boeing and then close your eyes and go to the beach for a while and then check it in a few years? It's March. Wait, oh, you it's can that time to go. <laughs> right, okay. and you don't want to fly anywhere right now. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, everybody, are you kidding me? I'm from Boston. I mean, people, uh, <laughs> the Tom Brady just is leaving, so we, yeah. Even Tom Brady's getting out of here. How, so. how are you holding up, Matt? Are you okay? <laughs> oh, I tell you, I, it's like, thank God it's, I'm in a new building that doesn't have windows that can open. You know? It's like, <laughs> people worry about the stock market. I was going <laughs> to... I, I do want to follow up a, with a question here, though, about volume. And we still see volume well above the 20-day average. At some point, with people saying that they don't want to go in here because it's too volatile, you don't want to get caught um, off sides, at what point will we start to see volume really drop, Matt? Or is that not going to be the case as long as there is this volatility and someone out there is benefiting from the swings? 
Well, I'll tell you, one of the things I think, and what usually happens, and, and even though things have gotten incredibly more compressed, I mean, the market dropped uh, uh, 30 of uh, 30 percent in 18 trading days. Uh, it took 350 uh, in 2008 for it to drop 30 percent, 350 days. Uh, but I don't think, see, so what usually happens is you need a multi-day or even a multi-week rally that fails. That's when people, that's when human nature goes, oh, this is, it's all over. And then the market rolls right. over another time and they're out. And they say, that's it, I'm, I'm out. I wish I had sold when I had the chance. That's when you get the capitulation, the real capitulation. And that's when, then, then you see the volume start to dry up and the market can climb back. So I'm afraid we may have to see one more, but we usually won't get that until we get a multi-day rally that gives people uh, the feeling that the coast, is, coast mm. is clear. That's the cruel thing about markets, isn't it? They give you hope. They make you feel like exactly. you're smart, and then they make you feel like you're stupid. And right now, what you're saying is, we may need one more washout so that any last vestiges of hope, confidence, good feelings, anything like that is completely washed out. We might not be there yet. Uh, I, I think, I'm afraid that's probably the case. What it's do you think, what Vince? Happens, I mean, say, I mean, Vince, what do you think? No. Is, is that your take, that we haven't reached market capitulation? No, I, I totally agree. I mean, there are things that you need to, like, I think markets for today, for instance, completely overlooking is, you know, number one, uh, retail sale number for February, which which didn't really uh, have much of the impact of the virus just yet, uh, missing expectations. You've not seen any of this money really flow through. Whatever the Fed is doing, it's doing for liquidity for the banks. This this really isn't helicopter money in a real sense. We don't know what the fiscal response yet is. Markets liking at least that they're getting to a place on that. But I don't see anybody cutting the prime rate. I don't see anybody lowering mortgage rates. I don't see any money going to the consumer mm. to try to help the real economy. This is a once again, and I think that's right, a major head fake for the markets. And until we do really test the downside, I think we've got more to go. Uh, but, you know, again, if you're going to look someplace and if you really want to step in, I'd look at the places, as Matt said, Boeing well sold off. I agree completely. Uh, and there are other places to go as well where you can where you can get in for 12 months from now and and not feel you're still underwater. All right. All right. Well, thank God it's Friday. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it feels early. It's only Thursday, right? Oh, 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 okay. All right. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Vince Signorella, the voice of the Bloomberg Audio Squad, <laughs> joining us by phone, just the voice, and Matt Milley of Miller Tayback. This is Bloomberg. Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters here in New York, I'm Romain Boston. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. And if you look at the markets today, we were down 11, 12 percent. Today, we're up 6 percent, 5 percent. Um, 10 percent, no, excuse me, 23 percent of the S&P 500's members rose more than 10 percent today. But yesterday, we had two-thirds of the S&P 500's members falling more than 10 percent. Yeah. Did we look at the lines before? I feel like we we missed the lines, and I was missing them. No, oh. here's the lines now. I mean, okay. we did look at it briefly, but right. just to give you a sense, here's the last three days. Let's let's just click on that just to show you yeah. uh, how wild, wild things move have been. been. Yeah. yeah, there you go. It's been a wild move, and obviously the superlatives, it's easy to get to the percentages mixed up uh, over the last few days that we've had here. I mean, you take a look at where we are in equities, but then you also talk about, uh, Joe, you brought this up, what we saw uh, in uh, the Treasury market. Again, yeah. starting to see money come out of that. Again, not really clear the reason why, but you're talking about 1088 right now on your 10-year yield uh, and about <laughs> 50 basis points on the two-year yield. Your 30-year yield back up uh, to 170 right now. And then we should also point out, too, the dollar just had a monster day today. The Bloomberg Dollar Spot Index uh, was up about 1.3% uh, on the day uh, the last time I checked, 1.38%. Uh, that's uh, basically a three-year high now uh, versus uh, that basket of uh, major uh, G10 currencies. Yeah, we can see from the market reaction a lot more enthusiasm so far about the prospect of fiscal stimulus versus anything the Fed has done. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the Fed is out of tools. So for more, let's bring in Skanda Amarnath, Director of Research and Analysis at Employ America. And he's calling for the Federal Reserve to do a lot more, including muni bond purchases. So let's talk about this. Skanda, so far, 
the Fed has pulled out what in the traditional playbook might be considered all the stops. So it's cut rates to basically zero. It's doing all these uh, massive repo operations. It announced that it's going to uh, expand the balance sheet by $700 billion in assets split between treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. It has not done that much yet. But you propose something that the Fed can currently do now within its existing legal uh, mandate. Why don't you tell us further what they can do on the muni front? Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, so the, on the muni front, the Fed has the power to buy short-term uh, state and local government debt. So anything with a maturity of less than six months, uh, the Fed can buy. And they, unlike even some of the actions they took today regarding the commercial paper funding facility, the Fed doesn't even have to go through Treasury to do it. Uh, so state and local governments are obviously on the front lines of this public health right. crisis. Right. And, they, and the ability for the Fed to kind of loosen up the sort of financing options for those governments could really make a big difference, especially when you think about those are the entities that are actually going to be need to spend the money right now. So, so Skanda, I mean, we did see uh, some of those spreads widening, but we haven't seen like huge cracks yet in the muni market. I'm just wondering that if the Fed were to sort of uh, go down this path, what would be sort of the threshold uh, for them to sort of decide to make those purchases? I think there are two, just to get to your first point regarding the cracks, we have seen, especially because fixed income liquidity has seriously deteriorated over the past week, that even in the muni market, that spreads have widened relative to treasuries. And if you're thinking about this from the standpoint of a state and local government that is ultimately cash constrained, financially constrained, right. they're otherwise going to look at um, spending cuts. And we've already started to see here signs that certain state governments and certain, like the D.C. government is already considering cutting spending elsewhere to respond to the current panic, because ultimately they re rely on tax revenue otherwise to uh, fund all of their operations or m most of their uh, expenditures. So if the Fed can step in there, I think it can make a big difference. And in that same way, this is a public health crisis. This isn't a banking crisis. Right. I think actually state and local governments make a lot more sense from that perspective. Skanda, what would you think of expanding the, the Fed's mandate so that it buys other kinds of assets in addition to, say, munis? Um, people have been talking about maybe equities, the way that Bank of Japan buys equities through ETFs. I, I think I would focus specifically on the crisis at hand and the Fed. Um, what's actually going to trigger more spending and get money into the right entity's hands quick, most quickly? So... I think it's pretty logical in this case, and the Fed has the legal authority. So those are the two most attractive aspects of the Fed actually engaging in this market right now and hopefully making it easier for a state government to issue short-term mm -hmm. debt that is pretty cheap and affordable. Equities and um, corporate credit, I think those are areas where, one, it's what is the actual – what is it actually going to do to solve the problem? Um, and, two, they don't have the authority to do that right now. I would actually – prefer actions that are going to affect those who are most um, in need of the funding and will actually do the most good in terms of responding to the current economic and public health fallout. Let's talk a little bit more about that legal authority, because, of course, when the Fed buys treasuries or government backstop mortgage-backed securities, they're essentially trading one risk-free government liability reserves for another risk-free government liabilities treasuries. Even at the short end of the uh, municipal bond curve, there is the introduction of credit risk, right? Because there is not a uh, state and municipalities, they can't print money. So theoretically, they can go broke and go default. Talk to us about why uh, your reading is that the Federal Reserve does have the legal authority to take that kind of risk. And is there a limiting factor on how much then state and local authorities could then issue just and flip to the Fed? So... There is direct – the statute is incredibly clear that the Fed has the authority to buy these securities. And when we think about credit risk, right, the mortgage-backed securities are a pretty good example where there is in some ways a credit risk that the government insulates. Right. So the question here is whether municipal debt, which is, again, I don't think we should call for them to be actively engaged – all the time, but in a public health crisis, is this the time when we should be trying to sure. encourage arbitrary penny pinching? I would say no. All right. Our thanks there to Skanda.
Armanath uh, from Employ America. All right, coming up here, as the market volatility continues, ETF volumes, they're spiking. We're going to discuss that coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Markets have been moving wildly all week with ETFs in the center of the action. So here with us uh, on the phone is Eric Bauchunas, senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence who covers ETFs. And Eric, uh, clearly the volume that we see in ETF trading is through the roof, which is what you would expect. But certainly with the growth of passive investing, uh, it's taken a lot of people by surprise just how much uh, heavier volume can be versus uh, trading in individual stocks. Different people keep maligning ETFs as kind of driving some of the wild swings. Uh, what's your take on it? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I tend to lean pro ETF. I think they absorb a lot of liquidity. Um, I do think that they, you know, when they trade away from the NAV or the net asset value, I think that's something you have to keep an eye on because I think, if anything, that points to how illiquid certain areas can get, namely the bond market. And so you have a choice. You could, if you're somebody who is uh, in the market, you could sell the bonds. Right. And buy the ETF and pocket the difference. Um, and a lot of people would not do that, waiting for the ETF to go a little cheaper, a little cheaper. So I think when you see some of those dislocations, they just speak to how illiquid the underlying is at that time. Let's talk about uh, high-yield bond ETFs, because this is a recurring fear in other market environments as well, which is that an ETF like, say, HYG, a popular high-yield ETF, trades as liquid as a stock, but there is no way its underlying assets as a whole can possibly trade that much because the, you know, the high-grade credit market, high-yield credit market is just not as liquid. During times of stress, like we've seen over the last couple of weeks, how well have these performed in terms of roughly, in, uh, in, as far as we can tell, maintaining a link in, uh, between the pricing of the ETF and the underlying basket? Yeah, this is a great point, and it's frequently called the liquidity mismatch. I think right. junk bonds are where people focus on the most, and it's legit. I mean, how could you have something that trades an exchange that holds something where the bond, like a lot of bonds in HYG don't even trade every day? So it's very difficult. But I will say HYG in particular, I think, did better than most expected. If you look at mm. the premium and discounts over the past couple of days, they've been around 1% or lower. Uh, I was pretty shocked by that. Huh. But you got to remember, the junk bonds in HYG have a, a, a duration of about three years. What we saw is as you go out the curve, that's when some of the dislocations got worse. So LQD, to me, did way worse than I thought. It's been at like 2 3% for the past couple days. So I do think that this is uh, part of the reason we give certain bond ETFs a yellow light in our traffic light system because the underlying is less liquid. And in the case of junk bonds, it's a risk asset. It can sell off very quickly. You know, we equate uh, a junk bond ETF to uh, 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 owning a, a house uh, on the beachfront in Florida. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's got a lot of benefits, but you better expect the occasional hurricane. Right. Now, explain also how investors use uh, HYG and other high-yield ETFs. Some active investors are very much the, the holders of these, of these funds, of these instruments. And uh, when they sell out of them, they're, they're using them, or when they buy them, they're using them as a so-called liquidity sleeve. Explain what that means. Yeah, so here's what's kind of ironic is a lot of the reason for the discounts that we've seen in the past couple, uh, the past two weeks, is active mutual funds, uh, bond funds, will hold these, a lot of these ETFs. Like if uh, a high-yield active mutual fund uh, will hold HYG, maybe they'll have 3% of the portfolio allocated to HYG instead of cash. This way they have beta to the high-yield market, and they have something liquid they can sell in a flash. So the flash has happened, right? So yeah. if any bond ETF, a bond mutual fund, has had any redemptions whatsoever, it's likely the first thing they sold was the ETF. And that fund has a choice. They could sell bonds in the portfolio or the ETF. And it looks like they're continuing to choose the ETF for now. At some point, the ETF could have a discount that's great enough where the bonds actually make sense to sell. But that's sort of uh, an interesting irony and what could be further selling pressure because if yeah. active mutual funds see outflows, that would equal uh, more selling pressure on some of the bond ETFs. Eric, we only got about 30 seconds left. Obviously, a lot of eyes have been on the SPY, particularly with all the limit ups and limit downs we've seen on SPX. What are we seeing with regards to flows, and what does that tell us? Yeah, the flows are all over the place. Uh, they took, it, SPY took in $7 billion yesterday. That could be people creating new shares just to short it. But it also could be dip buying. It's very hard to tell with SPY. 
Yeah. I think with Spy, what I want to note is some f good news here, which is the volume in Spy, yeah. which to me is like a fear gauge, is down for the uh, four, fourth straight right, day. Eric, so it looks like we're going to have to leave bit. it there, Eric. Our thanks there to Eric Falcunas, Bloomberg Intelligence Alan Analyst. This is Bloomberg. The coronavirus and the oil price war between the Russians and the Saudis has disrupted global commodities. Plus, it's left a lasting impact on food supply chains. So for joining us more, joining us with more now is Sarah Manker, founder and CEO of Grow Intelligence, who has analyzed the ripple effects to this market. Food, uh, Sarah, as anyone knows, is a source of deep anxiety. We see it in the grocery stores. Any, uh, it's it strikes existential terror, the thought that maybe like you would go to the grocery store and it wouldn't be there. From your perspective, how robust and sturdy are the supply chains that we have right now for food? I mean, the supply chains have never been more fragile um, due to a combination of things, right? Um, you know, you have uh, actual shipping flows being disrupted as a result of coronavirus. You have uh, supply constraints that are starting to emerge because of the demand patterns of consumers starting to change in terms of how they're purchasing in supermarkets, obviously, as, as different cities go into lockdown mode. So the average home is purchasing way more food than it does right. on an you know, average day or a week. Um, and so managing the supply chains of, A, what is needed right now, and then what happens over the next you know, four, six, eight weeks uh, in terms of demand planning, it, 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 it's never been more complicated. Uh, even in, you know, what used to be the most transparent market in the world in the U.S., it's just as complex as really anywhere else right now. So, Sarah, I mean, when we talk about the complexity of the market, I mean, a big part of that market for uh, the, the last, you know, few years, few decades has been sort of that interchange from country to country and the idea that, you know, we could sort of move around uh, that food supply based on which countries uh, demanded uh, whichever sort of part of that chain they wanted. Uh, given some of the issues with coronavirus, given obviously the trade issues that preceded that, uh, are we seeing disruptions in that flow that maybe could end up distorting uh, how we sort of assess what's available and what's ready? We're massive. We're seeing massive distortions already. Um, you know, you're see, you obviously initially saw a lot less shipments going into China um, and into parts of Asia. So Japan, Korea, when you look at shipping flows out of, you know, major exporters such as the U.S., Brazil, Argentina, you're basically seeing a massive backlog um, of, you know, essentially ships waiting to, to, to depart. And so the flows have just been massively reduced. And what's happened is obviously that a lot of countries are now just basically tapping into inventory uh, to replenish mm. that sort of supply. And that, that obviously works for things like grains and, um, and, you know, products that you can store, but that's not how fresh produce works. And so in areas like proteins, fresh produce, et cetera, you know, you're just seeing actual immediate price reactions uh, because you don't have that sort of inventory buffer. And so, you know, what's going to be interesting to see as, as, as this plays out is, A, when do these bottlenecks start to be removed? B, do countries start thinking of inventory of food in a fundamentally different way after this experience, which I, I believe they will? Um, and then C, how does that start to impact the decisions that are going to be made by farmers in places like the U.S. that yeah. are being forced to make planting decisions at, at a very, very difficult time for them personally because balance sheets are just very weak? Right. Um, so lots these, of uncertainty. Yeah, these are all great points that you bring up. Um, here in the U.S., I want to get into what you said about tapping into, into inventory. Do we know whether farms and meat processing plants have enough people to even do the work as mm. they're trying to replenish their inventory? We know the labor market was already pretty tight before the virus even hit. So, you know, I think with, if you think of farming, farming has, you know, moved to a largely kind of automated world uh, in, in terms of farming for row crops years ago. And it, you've seen more and more automation happen. Um, and a lot of that season doesn't kick in until actually now, right? So what's happening is obviously farmers are having to decide what to plant. Now, when you go into the fresh produce industry, obviously that's a very different question because lots of fresh produce is still very manually harvested. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of labor required for harvesting. 
Um, and, and then you also have certain produce that gets shipped seasonally from parts of South America. So I think what's going to happen and, and, you know, what you're starting to see play out is in, if you look at purchasing in, in supermarkets is there's a lot of frozen foods being bought, not just fresh right. foods. Um, and so th- there's a bit of that interplay that's occurring as that as that supply kind of gets drained from the uh, supply chain that consumers can access, it it will start to be a relatively complicated you know, set of issues to manage yeah. because how do you have social distancing while harvesting? Um, you know, there's just fundamental things you're going to have to address. Well, I'm curious about that. Looking forward a little bit, so we have this sort of unprecedented crisis. We have this unprecedented hoarding in the U.S., people going to the supermarket. It's created all kinds of ripple effects. As you mentioned, uh, is, is maintaining the uh, supply chain creates issues in the era of social distancing. Then we might get major stimulus as governments around the world really try to press on the gas pedal to revive their economies once the worst of the health crisis has passed. Could we see, for the first time in a long time, potentially meaningful inflation on the food uh, front if you have this combination of supply chain disruptions meets major expectations of ramping up economic growth? That is one of my deepest worries uh, and my deepest fears, actually, globally, is that, um, you know, it, it's not just economic stimulus, but just the reality that, you know, as this is a global crisis, when you start to think about the distribution of food around the world mm-hmm. and the other shocks that other parts of the world are facing. So, you know, locusts in Eastern Africa and, and, and Pakistan some fall army worms and, uh, you know, all over Asia destroying crops, you're also having a destruction of supply actively happening. And so in these types of unprecedented moves, you're also having very large foreign exchange moves that create massive foreign exchange reserve issues right. uh, that can cause hyperinflation in these countries. So even without really, a you know, a, a demand surge occurring, you could already start to see uh some of that play out sooner than later. And, 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 and it could be very worrisome because you could also just be undersupplied. Sarah Menker giving us a lot to think about here. Sarah is founder and CEO of Grow Intelligence, and she was joining us by phone. Thank you so much. Let's get you checked out some business flash headlines, and we'll start with the world's largest hotel company. Marriott is starting to lay, t- lay off tens of thousands of employees. Uh, Marriott is closing some hotels and needs fewer workers at the ones that do remain open. In the U.S., the company has about 130,000 staffers. NBA games are on hold because of the coronavirus, but Bloomberg has learned that the teams are still getting payments from their broadcasting partners. One of those broadcasters, ESPN, won't say whether it's making the payments. It does say, though, that it is confident issues can be discussed constructively. The two largest American theater chains will close all their U.S. locations starting today. That is following pressure from government officials to limit public gatherings. AMC says its movie halls will be closed for 6 to 12 weeks. Regal says theaters will be shut indefinitely. And that is your Business Flash update. From New York, this is Bloomberg. All right, investors around the world, of course, trying to figure out the economic fallout from the coronavirus. Some of the more traditional metrics not necessarily working at the moment. Symptom focus online, search activity surging. And there's a lot of other metrics out there that some investors are trying to rely on to get a sense of what's happening. Joining us right now to discuss this on the phone, Benjamin Breitholtz. He's Arbor Research and Trading Data Scientist. Uh, Benjamin, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's going to be weeks before we get some real hard data from the sort of the traditional uh, economic measures that we rely on for GDP, durable goods, and others that will capture sort of this period we're in now. Uh, what are some of the other metrics, maybe the high-frequency metrics out there, that folks are maybe turning to to try to get a sense of how the economy has been affected by the COVID-19 scare here? Precisely. So, you know, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of consumers and businesses' search activity via Google, and we're really trying to measure this in two different ways, one being the psychology and the actual spread of the virus itself via symptom-based search trends, and then also we're looking at consumer activity. So everything from 
uh, how much people are going out to restaurants, to going to the trampoline park, to going out to, to look at new real estate. We're trying to get a flavor on a day-to-day -day basis how much consumers are really seeing that sudden stop and how much they are concerned about the spread of the virus. Okay, so of the data that you're tracking, how much confirms what we already suspect? And what are you really, what, what have you seen that really surprised you? So what we would expect is happening. So on one side, this is good in that we're getting the quarantining and the social distancing. What we've seen is a high degree of, or really a lot of search activity stop abruptly for going out. So everything from traveling, urban transport like Ubers, restaurants, and so on. The unfortunate thing that we're seeing is there are kind of um, the big part of the economy that's been so strong, housing, is looking like it could be under pressure in that searches for real estate listings, home improvement, property inspections, those have actually dropped almost as much as a lot of these other travel-related, kind of going out-related search activities, uh, which to us is a sign that you know the consumer is indeed getting this full right. stop, and what could be this important industry is, is potentially going to be damaged. So it's been a long time since I've heard of anyone buying anything other than soap, hand sanitizer, toilet paper, and canned <laughs> goods. What about other types of discretionary purchases? Like, is anyone, say looking for a new pair of Jordans right now? <laughs> well, that is specifically we don't pull in. But, okay. I mean, everything from um, just simple things like businesses purchasing, you know, business productivity software or uh, training yeah. type, type things. Uh, or even on the discretionary side, you know, buying things or looking for, you know, fitness, new gyms or fitness equipment. These types of, uh, of things, surprisingly, even though you're at home and you should still be exercising, uh, are seeing precipitous drops that we really haven't seen historically in this data set that goes back to 2004. So a lot of this drop, um, you know, travel, going out, fitness, is something that just hasn't been seen since, again, this, this period of 2004. On the flip side, uh, what we've seen is dramatic rises uh, in search activity for outsourcing and in particular for medical devices. And this is another sticking point and an issue that, that the U.S. is going to have to go through in the search for N95 uh, respirators and medical ventilators. There's a large portion of the community, specifically rural, that are making excessive amount of search activity for these types of goods. So on one side, there's all this, this large precipitous drop, and then on the flip side, uh, we're getting these the signs of you know difficulty in the in the healthcare right. supply chain. When did it start? You say you have the data going back to 2004. Can you say was when the sudden stop started and the speed of the decline? How does it compare to anything you've seen since you've been collecting this data set? Yeah, well, let's go back first five weeks to when Italy uh, first had their rash of cases. And they're kind of the, the real first case here. And their drop in, um, in so, uh, social distancing, the drop in search activity for consumer goods and, uh, and services uh, was the first. And that really has dropped to the point where it's on par with three times um, the drop compared to the typical August drop in activity that we see when restaurants shut down and really kind of Italy goes in, in somewhat of a hibernation. Um, in the rest of Europe, we've seen the same thing happen on almost a two-week lag, and now we're getting this in the U.S. So really, the U.S. social distancing and the drop in consumer activity didn't begin until about March 10th or March 12th, uh, right around when market activity really got hmm. um, into trouble. Got it. Benjamin Breitholtz, Arbor Research and Trading Data Scientist. Thank you so much. Really interesting observations here, uh, giving us a, a read into some of the implications of COVID-19, the social distancing, and how they'll eventually show up in economic data. Now, uh, we want to bring you some headlines from Jeffrey Gunlock's conference call, his webcast. Uh, he was speaking in the webcast, and he made some comments, including this is the end of the longest post-war expansion. He put the odds of recession at 90%. And he said he warned the president that the virus stimulus that, of course, is under discussion right now is being negotiated could be prone to abuse. Um, he also says the stock market is in a world of hurt. So um, a pretty dire outlook there from Jeff Gunlock, who currently right now is talking about gold, saying the precious metal will soon hit a new high. All right. In the meantime, let's get you some business flash headlines as well.
We take a look at Apple, which now says its stores outside China will remain closed until further notice. It is no longer holding to the March 27th date for reopening. The stores will probably begin opening up after the end of March on a rolling basis. This depends on what rules local governments put in place by that time. Amazon now giving priority to shipping household staples and medical supplies. The world's largest online retailer has been struggling to deal with demand during the coronavirus pandemic. Amazon also won't accept shipments from third-party sellers in other product categories, at least through April 5th. And Elon Musk is signaling that Tesla's auto plant in Fremont, California will stay open. He's telling employees to come to work only if they are comfortable doing so. Musk says he will be there. He hasn't said whether employees who don't come in will still get paid. And that is your business flash update. Uh, we have some headlines? Yeah, we just want to bring you some breaking news here. This is coming from the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, the company is saying that it has no current plans to shorten the trading day. Uh, this is uh, coming uh, in an email uh, to uh, reporters here at Bloomberg News, uh, basically saying that they have been in dialogue with regulators. Of course, this is a reference uh, a little bit earlier to Steve Mnuchin's comments uh, that the government would potentially consider a shortened trading day. Nicely saying that's not happening, not just yet. From New York, this is Bloomberg. All right, Olympic organizers remain confident that the Tokyo Games will continue as planned. Meanwhile, sports betting companies are seeing sharp declines in revenue on account of a lack of live sports to bet on. For more, let's bring in Evan Novi williams Bloomberg Sports business reporter. Evan, let's start with the Olympics because everyone's watching to see what happens. We know they've made some adjustments, but so far, uh, the guys in Tokyo, the um, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and the IOC remain committed to the idea of holding the Games. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I think in the past, you know, even in the past five hours, we've seen two fairly big developments. The first being that the IOC, at least really for the first time, seems to have publicly recognized that things might get difficult. You know, after after weeks of essentially plugging their ears and saying, you know, these games are going to happen, they're going to happen as, as, as planned. Right. The IOC, at least today, recognized, you know, you know, things are in a fluid situation. We're looking at it day by day. For now, we'd like to get them in, but... You know, that might ha not happen uh, if things continue to get worse. So, Evan, I'm curious, though, about how they sort of assess just not so much the spectator aspect of this, but the player aspect of it. There was some news crossing the Bloomberg terminal that four players on uh, the Brooklyn Nets NBA team tested positive. You have a lot of sports where, uh, you know, the, the, there is no social distancing. You have to be <laughs> sort of in physical contact with uh, the other uh, people on the court or the field or whatever. So have the sports leagues actually talked about this and addressed how this uh, may sort of play out over the next uh, few months? Yeah, I think this is the, this is the big question. I mean, you heard Donald Trump say, uh, I believe yesterday, any event that has more than 10 people gathering should be, shouldn't happen. And as you said, that's every sporting event ever. You know, even these small Olympic qualifiers and trials, you know, you can't, you can't do any sporting event with, with 10 people or less. So, yes, everybody is looking at that. And when it comes to the Olympics specifically, I think everybody's eyes are on the games themselves. Is this going to happen when it tips off in July and early August? Uh, but the truth is that there are hundreds and hundreds of qualifiers that have to happen before you pick your teams to go to the Olympics. And those events are supposed to happen now. They were right. supposed to happen last week. They're supposed to happen next month. And all of those are getting disrupted as well. So it's really a cascading set of things that the IOC specifically has to think about. Uh, Evan, I, I have to, you know, there's a lot of people hurting these days, but one group that's really hurting are people who are uh, gambling junkies and looking for something <laughs> to place a bet on. The casinos are closed. There's no professional sports for the most part to bet on. What is being done? to ease the pain of people that just must get some action. Yeah, there's, there's two things happening. One is that sports betting operators are scouring every lower-level professional sport across the globe to see if they feel like they can reliably post odds on them. You know, this is Kazakhstan Premier League soccer. This is, oh, yeah. you know, you, oh, Ukrainian gosh. soccer. The real soccer junkies are betting on that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah, so that, that's number one. It's, it's just trying to get anything they can get on their site that you can bet on if you just feel the need to, to, to lay some coin on anything. The second thing they're doing is they're looking at uh, potentially non-sporting events they can wager on. DraftKings and FanDuel recently did uh, daily fantasy events around the Democratic debate on Sunday night, you know, which was, right. you know, a bunch of different odds on yeah. will Bernie Sanders say millionaire or billionaire first. So I think okay. you'll see more things like that. So politics and entertainment. 
yeah. you know, if they can if they can do gambling on events like that, you know, that can maybe bridge the gap between when the U.S. sports are back. Absolutely. Uh, Evan Novi Williams, uh, Bloomberg News Business of Sports Reporter. Thank you so much. Something else that they can bet on, where Tom Brady will land, what team he's going to play for eventually, because he's not going to be on the Patriots. Why did he just retire? Who is it? <laughs> All right, Bloomberg Technology is coming up next in the U.S. Have a good evening. This is Bloomberg.